podcast where we talk to smart people, but not necessarily done by smart people. That is an awesome question. This one goes down probably on one of my top five. Hey, I like nutrition. I like to eat food. This is the coolest thing ever. We're going to do this forever. I wish I paid more attention in that class. You know, I'm going to be honest. I don't understand that. <laughs> As a man, I just, I don't get it. Welcome to welcome smartpeoplepodcast.com. To smartpeoplepodcast.com. Hello and welcome to Smart People Podcast, conversations that satisfy your curious mind. Chris Stemp here. Let's get to it. Why am I so eager? Well, this week on the show, it is the second time we are interviewing the famous, the amazing, and now somebody I can say, the friend, Dave Burse. If you haven't already, we have interviewed Dave on episode 174, so feel free to go ahead and tune into that one after this as well. Additionally, we're talking about his brand new book, which is How to Get to Great Ideas, A System for Smart, Extraordinary Thinking. You'll notice the theme throughout this entire episode is this. It's not about learning from a guru. It's about following a process to get to the great ideas only you have. And he does it like a real mentor. And I really recommend for anybody out there trying to create a company, take their business to the next level, come up with their new idea, whatever it is, Dave's book is worth a read. No, I will say one caveat here. If you're in the States, his book is not out until April 2nd. However, go ahead to Amazon and pre-order it. So you don't have to think about it. It'll show up right at your doorstep and you'll be like, wow, I'm so glad I did that. For those of you who don't know who Dave is, Dave spent 20 years as an advertising creative coming up with ideas for some of the world's biggest brands. He led the creative departments of a number of the UK's top agencies, uh, including Ogilvy One, McCann World Group. He won a ton of awards along the way. His previous book that we discussed on the last episode was A User Guide to the Creative Mind, which is fantastic. And then, as I mentioned, his brand new one is How to Get to Great Ideas. Don't forget to head to smartpeoplepodcast.com and sign up for our newsletter if you'd like. And also, if you're a big fan of the show, go to smartpeoplepodcast.com slash society. That is our special society made up of, at this point, it's about, I want to say, 40 or 50 people. And... We really get to know you a little bit better, consider it more of a conversation. In fact, our society just helped us pick, spoiler alert, our brand new logo. You will be seeing that hit your podcasting app wherever you listen very soon. So thank you to our society members for helping us figure that one out. Oh, and by the way, when you sign up, you get a free book out of over 100 that you have to choose from. Caveat, we can no longer ship outside of the United States just because with customs and all this stuff, it's more expensive to send a book than it is to buy it on Amazon for you. It's crazy. Smartpeoplepodcast.com slash society. Here it is, one of the world's most creative people, Dave Burse, and we talked to him about his new book, How to Get to Great Ideas. Enjoy. Well, Dave, you're back on the show. It wouldn't be Smart People Podcast without Dave Burris. How you doing? Oh, I'm doing wonderful. Thank you so much. And uh, hello, listener. I hope you are doing wonderful, too. They're doing great. They're doing great. We hear from them every now and again, you know. So, Dave, you know, you wrote this new book. Uh, I was so glad to hear from you and, and have you back on. It's been a while since we last chatted. So what I'd really like to hear, you know, as we as we kind of gear up to talk about your book, which is how to get to great ideas. Tell us about the evolution of this specific book and why you felt compelled to put it out there. Well, I, I guess everything has been compounded all the way back to me growing up in Scotland and being uh, a kid who was fascinated with the fact that Scottish heritage it seemed to be all about innovation. So it was Scots and Scotland that was behind so many big inventions, like television, the fax machine. You know, it was a Scot that uh, did uh, telephone and, and uh, fridges and toasters and all sorts of things. And, and it was like, wow, I want a piece of that. I, I, want, uh, I want a piece of that sort of innovation pie. I, I, I was just fascinated with it as a kid. So um, 
it ended up influencing the direction that I took. And then I was in advertising for 20 years, um, ended up being creative director of some agencies. And then I, I quit the, the advertising industry in 2010. And that was kind of a bit of a turning point for me because I want, I was interested in the power of ideas, but I was interested in ideas that didn't just fill a rectangle of media space. I was interested in ideas that, that had bigger impact and, and, and could shape companies, uh, organizations, uh, even uh, politics as well. So as I started to investigate that, you know, I, I thought I knew what creativity was when I was in advertising. It was in my title, after all. But I realized the more I looked into it, that really I probably didn't know what creativity was. And it's been a, a journey for me. And I've over that journey, I've, I've done studies, I've conducted experiments, um, I've interviewed lots of people. I've just been really trying to, to get down to what it is that makes people great at coming up with ideas. And now what I'm really fascinated in is what it is that makes organizations great at getting ideas out of groups of people and then making those ideas happen because that's all innovation is. It's based on ideas. And there was a study that was done by McKinsey last year that showed that as much as well as as much as 84 percent of CEOs believed that innovation was vital to the future of their organization. Only 6% of CEOs were satisfied with their company's innovation, 6%. So when you've got a shocking statistic like that, it shows that innovation is broken. It's not working within organizations. So I've been looking at what it is that is killing creativity and innovation in these organizations and how organizations can get better ideas out of their employees and then have a better chance of benefiting from the ideas they get. So it, it's been lots of questioning, <laughs> yeah. lots of thinking, lots of disagreeing with myself <laughs> and challenging myself. Um, lots of spending time with the answer, I don't know, um, wh which I think more people need to get used to. Yeah, is actually true. Yeah. being able to answer, I don't know, to something and, and, and don't say you've got an answer until you have an answer. Because, and, and not just repeat what other people have said either. I think there's a lot of echo chamber stuff in, particularly in creativity and innovation so i try to avoid the echo chamber and i try to question things and i'm, I'm really interested in uh, how academia can get involved in this as well so, so it's been a journey <laughs> well it always is and i'm gonna go ahead and play the role of ignorant american and i'm fine with that this is a global audience and and i'm you, fine you, with that you play it so well you know i do what i can <laughs> um and i'm gonna go back to what you said about you know scots and and their their creativity and their innovation because I'm going to be honest, I maybe again, it's just being American, but it's not the first thing that comes to mind when I think of Scottish. I, I think of William Wallace, right? I think of Braveheart. That's just me. But the television started, it was invented by a Scot, or how's that work? Or, or the refrigerator, yeah. or what? Tell me, tell me about this. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. My, my, my mother actually grew up two streets away from John Logie Baird, who was the inventor of television. And he, he was an amazing guy. He he created the, 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 the TV and the broadcast system and everything totally built in his technology. Um, then, there, I mean, there's so many other things like um, uh, tires themselves, uh, the, the sort of vulcanized tire system that was from Scotland and um, Tarmacadam as well. So the, the surface for roads was invented in Scotland, uh, the steam engine. Uh, in Scotland, you know, so many things like that, that, wow. that penicillin, penicillin was created by a, by a Scot. And, and to me, I, I would hear these stories growing up in Scotland. And that was the stuff that, that would inspire me. So I guess because it was all about creative thinking and ideas, that was what put me in the direction of creative industries, I guess. What is it about Scotland or Scottish or the culture that you think is the Petri dish for so much of this creativity? Yeah, I don't know if the Petri dish was invented by Scott. It might be. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a, certainly a very Scottish name, Petri. Yeah. But the, um, it was a time in history. Scotland, sadly, isn't quite as on fire with innovation as it used to be. There still is lots of innovation coming out, but it's not quite as it used to be. Um, this was a time in the 1800s particularly. And that seemed to be when Scotland was absolutely at the, the, the center of 
all these developments and in the early 1900s. And when we start to look at the at, at creativity and how ideas come out of particular areas and we look at the, the Medicis in Florence and, and we look at uh, the New York punk scene in the 70s and all of these things that when, when movements happened and it seemed as if ideas were just all coming from one place and there's so many, there's been lots of studies done into this and there's some really lovely insights. And it's about people bumping into each other and there being an influx of people from different areas as well. So there was a lovely study that was done of Broadway musicals. And, you know, I, I don't particularly enjoy Broadway musicals my, myself, um, but there's a study done into that. And, and it was to look at how successful they were and comparing the people who were working on each of the productions. And for each of the productions, they created this coefficient called Q. And Q was this number that depended on how many people had worked together on previous productions. So if there was lots of people had been in a previous production together, they knew each other, were familiar with each other, there would be a high Q coefficient for that musical. And if it was a bunch of strangers that had never been together before, there was a low Q coefficient. Now, if they compared this to go, right, looking at high Q and low Q, which musicals were the most successful? And they found it was almost a perfect bell curve where you needed to have the right mix of people who knew each other and people who didn't know each other. So you've got familiarity and comfort from a group of people, but you've also got these disturbers, these people who come in who are strangers who would be willing to question things and bring different approaches. And they found that if it had a particularly high Q or a particularly low Q, the musical was likely to be a flop. It was this beautiful point in the middle. And there's this sort of social uh, structure, this sort of social condition that we need to be able to get these times in history and these places where you've got people who are colliding, people from different cultures. And this is why it's really important for us to have uh, immigrants in our countries. It's really important for us to be clashing with different cultures and different people. And my concern is with political isolationism around the world at the moment, that that's actually going to prevent this bumping together of people. And that concerns me when it comes to ideas. I'm particularly concerned as a, as a Brit living in London. I, I'm really concerned about Brexit. Yeah. And if we're going to curb the free movement of people in the UK, I'm really concerned about um, what that's going to do for the ideas and for innovation within the UK. And I've written about it in newspapers and, and I, 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 it's a real concern. And I know it's a concern for, for me, for the States as well. My yeah. wife is American. We spend a lot of time in America. Um, and it, I, I think we need to understand that difference is the most valuable thing. We need to stop trying to be homogenous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was just, and I knew this, I, I knew this fact, but it just was on TV or something, and I saw it the other day and it renewed it, was the idea that when Hitler rose to power, there were so many really intelligent German people who immigrated to the United States, which then helped bolster our uh, understanding of you know, science and physics and all that, which then led to the atomic bomb, which, you know, and I'm not saying the atomic bomb is, is great by any means. I'm just saying that it was this kind of the rejection of diversity in Germany specifically and the rise of this terrible person, which led to the gain of America. That's just one odd but really poignant example of, Absolutely. And, and actually, if you read Elon Musk, right, I, I use this example to a lot of people when we talk about isolationism, right? He's from uh, South Africa. And when he was a young child and he was kind of precocious, but obviously really smart, he said his goal essentially was to come to the United States because it was this beacon of creativity. Well, imagine this same person today being like, nah, forget it. I'm not going to go there. Well, how, yep. how would that impact the economic stability or strength of something like America versus if they would have stayed in South Africa? So fun, funnily enough, I can actually tell you. Yeah. I can actually, yeah. Um, that if, if you look at the top, I believe it's either the top 100 or the top 1,000 most successful tech startups in, in the United States, in mm -hmm. Silicon Valley, 
51% of them have an immigrant as a founder. Wow. 51%. So, so if it wasn't for that, if it wasn't for immigration, if it wasn't for free movement of people and interesting people coming into the country, then there's so many companies. I mean, if it wasn't for immigration, you wouldn't have Apple because right? Steve, Steve Jobs' father was Syrian. Mm -hmm. uh, you wouldn't have Google. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you wouldn't have Tesla. It's absolutely incredible the, the, the importance of this movement of people. So when you look at diversity in organizations, and if you were to sort of split companies into the quarter most uh, diverse uh, companies and then go down to the quarter least diverse companies, this is what investors should be looking at when they're investing in companies. I believe the figure is the difference between the top most diverse and the least diverse is, I believe it's just over 40% in profit. So the, the most diverse are more than 40% more profitable than the least diverse. So diversity is so important. <laughs> Yet we just look at so many industries and we just see that it's just white middle class men. Mm -hmm. And that's, I just think that's awful. Well, and what's interesting is when we have, you know, two white men on this conversation and, we, you know, well, and, and I say this Turkey's because, Christmas. because <laughs> I, we've had listeners along the way bring up to our attention, like your show is lacking in diversity and they're, they're absolutely right. And we've, we've tried to do something about it and there's a, a, a good deal of it that is our fault. Um, but there's also this thing where a lot of the guests we have on the show have pitched us. And so I purposefully go back and look at, say we get 400 pitches in a year or 500 or 600, whatever it is. It's a lot. I guarantee you, I guarantee you 90% are white men. I guarantee you. And so what is it about that system that's set up in a way where we just happen to get emails and, and pitches by 90% of white men? That is something that I've spent a lot of time recently also due to listener emails, trying to uncover. I don't know what it is. Could we do something for the, the podcast? Could we have a diversity month? Yeah, yeah. And actually do, can we do a call out? Can we do a shout out? And even just between our contacts or anyone who's a listener who's got interesting people worth talking to here, to actually get people who are from diverse backgrounds to talk about the importance of diversity in business and see if, 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 if we can get to this, to see, to work out how can we create something that's a platform that is more diverse. Yeah. Because we, we, we need it so much. Well, let's do that. And so for, for everyone listening at this moment, you know, smartpeoplepodcast at gmail.com. Shoot us an email. And I'll tell you what helps is if you know someone who would be a great guest with a diverse background or if you want to recommend someone, if you have, if you can help us find the contact information, because one of our barriers here is John and I run the show. We have families, jobs, all this stuff. It's the ease of which we can get guests on is a big plus, right? So just want to put that out there because I, it's something that's been bothering me and rightfully so our, our listeners have been bringing it up. So um, I'm glad it's something we talked about and we, we, we covered here because it's important with creativity, which is your thing. Right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's absolutely vital. Yeah, there, there's other sort of stats that I've got from people. Um, I, I know that from people who've been abroad. Um, so 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 British people who have gone and lived abroad and then come back, that they've got a far higher chance of being entrepreneurial, starting up a company once they wow. come back. And we're talking again about 30 or 40 percent um, people who are immigrants who come into the country. Again, there's UK stats that they are. Um, again, 30 to 40 percent more likely to start a business than um, somebody who's been born and raised in the UK. Wow. So it's really, really important for if we're looking for ideas for people to be able to embrace other cultures, experience other cultures and, and be able to, I guess, even sort of question their own culture uh, as, as well. As you talked about creativity and, and we started talking about Scotland and being Scottish. The previous book that you wrote that we had you on last time was A User's Guide to the Creative Mind. And what I'm interested in is your maturation, if if you believe it's that, or at least what was it that prompted you to say, okay, I wrote that book, it was great, and now I have a different way to discuss it in this new book. 
Well, do you know, I, I don't go that I've I've written that book and it's great. I actually had to re reread that book earlier this year, and I was a bit embarrassed of it. Really? And, and yeah, uh huh. Um, I mean, it is a short book, um, but there was a publisher in Macedonia who asked me if they could translate the book and publish it in Macedonian. And I went through the book and I actually slightly rewrote parts of it because there was bits in there that I now disagree with because my, my thinking has moved on. Right, as it should. Um, so I, I expanded it. I slightly rewrote it. Um, I made it, I, I had written it, it focused on the advertising industry. I, I, I rewrote parts to broaden it up so that it was more useful to other industries as well. And uh, that was released uh, three weeks ago in Macedonia, um, translated. And, and in Macedonia, it, it's called Upots Vaza Upotreba Na Creative Niot Um, which is the wow. Macedonian version of a user guide to the creative mind. Um, and I, I'm going to be bringing that out early next year as a revised edition, which the stuff that I now disagree with will be dealt with. And um, there will be extra material in it, and there's some cartoons that I've drawn, and and it will be a, a an expanded version of the book. But yeah, my 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 thinking really has moved on. I, one of the things that you find when you're writing is a way of crystallizing your thought. So what you're doing when you're writing something is is you're kind of like crystallizing where your mind is at that particular moment in time. And it becomes a, a stake in the ground that you knock into the ground and it becomes, this was where my thinking was at that point in history. And as you change and you start questioning, because when you write a book, people will start to talk to you about that subject matter because they know you're interested in it. And that very much happened to me after writing a user guide. And all of these conversations I've had has shaped my own thinking. And I've really, I'm always on this journey, always challenging what I think. And, you know, maybe with how to get to great ideas, as much as it's only been out for, I don't know, six weeks, I think, something like that, um, it, uh, I may disagree with it in five years' time. Well, you know, there might, be, there might be things in there that I go, mm, my thinking's moved on. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> well, <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> here's, here's the thing, though. And in, in, in all honesty, I was talking to my dad about this recently. I'll never forget, we had a guest on who was talking about the science of sleep. And in it, I said, you know, I, I asked some question asking for a definitive. And the person said, look, I'll I'll give you my answer. But I can tell you at some point in the future, someone will prove some of this wrong. And and I had a, a listener who emailed and said, when I hear your guests talk about their uncertainty, it makes me want to tune in more because I believe them more. It's the people who say this is how it is that I believe haven't thought deeply enough. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the whole thing with scientists. Um, people very often think that scientists are people who are saying that this is the truth, this is the way it is, that actually all the best scientists are like, based on our current understanding, mm -hmm. yeah. this is what we believe mm -hmm. it is. But this is the this is what we are taking as fact until something that's better comes along and displaces it. Right. And that's what good scientists that's their approach. And that, that's very much my belief that at the moment, how to get to great ideas, I'm very proud of. Um, I think it's got some challenging thinking in there. I think it's got some really helpful stuff in there. I've been getting good feedback from people about it, but it is where my mind is at this moment in time. And my mind will continue to evolve because I will never stop asking questions. And I'm interested to see what else I'll discover and how much of this I'll disagree with in the future. So this is this is what I believe at this moment in time until something better comes along. <laughs> yeah, well, and if it helps people out there, because for the longest part of my life and one of the reasons why I started this podcast was I wanted answers. And so sometimes when they hear from people such as yourself or other scientists, world renowned scientists that we've had on that say, well, this is our best thinking. It can get a little frustrating in a world where it's like, no, but I want answers. You know, why Why would I read somebody's book if they're going, at the, at the moment, this is my best thinking, but maybe it's going to shift. And to, to me, the reason is it's to spark your own thinking. It's to formulate your vision of the world by the willingness to grow through others' experiences. And that's just something that took me a long time to 
to come to terms with. Yeah, I mean, what I've got in the book is I'm creating models and frameworks that are based on an understanding. I mean, it's based on academia. So there's lots of academic thinking that's gone into, gone into this. There's lots of research and studies that have gone into this. But, you know, it's it's based on available knowledge. Right now, I've created models. And a model is never the truth. A model is a useful way of understanding mm -hmm. an object, mm -hmm. a, a subject. So, so that's what I'm trying to do, is just trying to create more useful or easier or, or implementable uh, models that um, that can help people deal with an issue that's currently shrouded by so much BS and so much mystery and so much misunderstanding. This week's episode is brought to you by Blinkist. In today's age, it can be hard to find the time to sit down and learn more, especially when the likes of social media can be so addictive and time-consuming. So you may think you don't have time to read a book or to develop yourself. Well, think again. Blinkist is the only app that condenses thousands of nonfiction books into the best key takeaways and need-to-know information. So you can read or listen to them in just 15 minutes. 8 million people are using Blinkist right now, and it has a massive and growing library. From self-help, business, health, to history books. I like Blinkist because in less than 15 minutes... I feel like I can fast track my path to a more intelligent me. In keeping with the theme, I've got to make another recommendation from a previous Smart People podcast guest. My recommendation this week, Homo Deus, A Brief History of Tomorrow by Yuval Noah Harari. So listen up. Here's what you have to do. Right now, for a limited time, Blinkist has a special offer just for the Smart People podcast listeners. Go to Blinkist.com dot com slash smart to start your free seven day trial. That's Blinkist spelled B L I N K I S T dot com slash smart to start your free seven day trial. That's Blinkist dot com slash smart. And now back to the episode. Well, I think that's a perfect lead into the C word because that was, you know, that was one careful, of, Chris, exactly. Careful. Hey, it's my podcast. We say whatever we want, right? Um, but uh, that was one of my favorite parts that, that brought me into this book because as most people listening right now, we're in this world inundated by information, but really the same information. There's creativity, there's culture, there's effectiveness. You know, there's, there's a lot of buzzwords constantly. Um, but tell us about your take on clarifying creativity and what is the answer to it? Like, what is creativity and why did you feel it needed to be discussed? Oh, there, there's so many misunderstandings. You know, when I when I go to companies and um, they, they know that I, I've got this reputation, I'm the creative guy. You know, I get I get really embarrassed about that because I'm embarrassed about the word creativity is that the. That creativity is is so badly misunderstood. I mean, going all the way back to ancient Greek understandings, that it was the muses that were these uh, uh, godlike beings who brought the ideas to us, and we were merely the vessels to their thinking. You know that that kind of nonsense. But you can understand why they thought that because that was based on their best knowledge at the time, their best understanding at the time, and the time everything was explained by gods. So they knew that there was this mystical thing that happened where ideas seem to come to us pretty fully formed without us thinking about them sometimes. And there's something very magical and beautiful about that. So using their understanding of the time, they explained it as, as muses. And there's still a certain amount of that mystique that it has continued to surround the area of creativity as almost as, as being some spiritual kind of thing. So there, there was, because I had this frustration from going into companies and they would very often say, yeah, we want you to help us with creativity and ideas. And I'd be like, great, great, good. That's what I do. Uh, can you come in and teach us brainstorm techniques? And it's like, no, no, brainstorms are awful. That's not what it's about. <laughs> you know, I, de I, de I debunk brainstorms in the book, but, you know, that's what people thought it was about. So there, there was, there was misunderstandings and and. Because of that, I did a study and, and I just put a web page up and it was just called What is Creativity? With a, with a box saying, don't consult a dictionary, don't Google it, 
just start typing what you think it is here. And I got hundreds of responses. And the one thing that united all of those responses is that they were crap. Um, and they showed incredible misunderstandings. And there, there was things that I'd find is, is that you would get a kind of like pseudo spiritual thing where people, there was one answer I got that was something like, it's the soul manifesting itself in the world. And you're just like, no, <laughs> I don't even know what that means. Please. <laughs> I know it's just, it's this pseudo spiritual nonsense. And, and, and then there would be stuff where people would be, um, talking about the process, which is, which is good for us. I, I think I like that slightly more scientific approach. There, there's this mis misunderstanding that some people are creative and other people aren't. And that's something that I'm always battling against. Um, so I took all of this stuff from the study and I, I categorized it and looked at the different misunderstandings people have. And that was quite shocking for me, seeing that there wasn't a consistent understanding of creativity. I mean, even in academia, there's not a consistent understanding of what creativity is. So I was trying to get to the bottom of that. And the way that academia talk about it is it's kind of like a matrix with two different axes on it. And one of the axes is newness. So it's something that's new or original. And then there's value. And yeah, value is good, but I've got a problem with new and original because something might be new to you, but I might have seen it before. So is it still new? So, you know, is it, is it, is it something that's new to you? Is it something that's new to the group of people that you're with? Is it something that's new to uh, your country? Is it something that's new to your industry? Is it something that's new to the world? I know there, there's a, a quote from the Bible from like two and a half thousand, three thousand years ago, and it's, there is nothing new under the sun. And to be honest, that's pretty much true. Yep. So, so when we're looking at newness, that becomes an impossibility. So what I talk about is it's not about newness, it's about um, non-obviousness. So we're looking for ideas that are non-obvious because any idea that's obvious is a first thought. You know, anyone could come up with it. It's not great. <laughs> so we're looking for stuff that is non-obvious. It's the stuff that takes a little bit of extra work, maybe a little bit sideways thinking to get to it. And if it adds value to us in some way, and again, we have to define what we mean by value, then we get something that's non-obvious and valuable. That is the stuff that we consider to be creative, as wow. far as I'm concerned. That's my definition of it. And as we can see there, non-obviousness is a sliding skill. So we're not looking at this as a binary thing of this is creative and that's not creative. We're seeing it as a sliding scale of non-obviousness. And I think that makes it easier for people to get on board and to understand that actually, if we're to look at solutions to problems, great ideas, things that we consider to be a creative approach, there's actually sometimes looking to the past isn't a bad thing. So one of the solutions that, that has been looked at to try and curb single-use plastics and stop people with plastic water bottles, and America is the worst offender for this, the plastic water bottles, um, is reintroducing water fountains mm -hmm. for people to drink at water fountains. Now, that's not a new idea, but it's non-obvious because everyone else has been looking at bottles. Can we use less plastic? Can we use stuff that we can recycle? No, 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 no. Why don't we actually just do something that is the non-obvious approach? It's not new. <laughs> Let's just get more... Uh, more water fountains. Uh, you know, it's a much better way of dealing with it. And you know what I love about a lot of these water fountains that I've seen is not only do they look nicer, right? And then there's a counter that says, here's how many water bottles you've saved or or have been yeah. saved because of this fountain. And there you go, a non-obvious, but there's, there's some, I don't want to call it gamification, but quantification that makes you feel a little bit better. So I, I love that yeah. example. What about if you come up with something that is non-obvious until you define it? Like one of my favorite phrases is common sense, not always common practice. In my workshops, I'll say something and, and I always notice after the fact, people go, oh yeah, that's common sense. But before the fact, it wasn't to them. Would you consider or have you ever thought about that type of creativity? Something that somebody's able to verbalize or show and then afterwards, it seems like it should have been obvious. 
that that to me has I, I guess having worked in in advertising for so many years it, it was always something that that we would talk about in, in in the industry it was actually is if you can create something that it takes a lot of work to get to the obvious solution is very often yeah. something that we'd say to get something that feels so obvious so clear uh so simple that takes a lot of effort to get there because initially it's all about complexity and that's actually one of the one of the roles of, of creativity is to take complexity and bring it down to simplicity and that's that there's a lot of strategy that goes into that and a lot of people don't understand what strategy is um all strategy is is a framework to uh, to help you judge your thinking by i think when we start applying strategic thinking to stuff we can start to give order to it we can start to filter things out and we can start to get to uh, simplicity and but people don't know how to get there and what it is is it's just a step by step process of just categorizing things thinking about stuff questioning things you know and and you just do it step by step until you get to the result of that process which is something that's simple and clear and a lot of people that they just get uh intimidated by the chaos they don't know where to start so they go i can't do it. that that's one of the things i loved about when you discuss reimagining creativity in your book is you know, to some people, it might be like, why do we need to put a definition on creativity? Or, you know, isn't that the antithesis of creativity, making it finite and defined? But the way you explain it is if you leave it in this spiritual or vague sense, then you're really removing its power from a lot of people who feel like they are not curious. I really enjoyed that take you had on it. Yeah. And I, I mean, I want everyone to be able to embrace this in, in their own way. I, I believe that this is something that should be part of our school systems. I'm not saying taught in schools because I, I, I think there's a certain amount of creativity that you can teach, creative skills and, and, and stuff, but it's actually it's more to do with how you embed it into the way you teach, not what you teach. So um, the very foundation of creativity is curiosity and schools and our workplaces are all about stamping out curiosity. They're about telling you what to think, not telling you how to think. This is one of our biggest issues that we, as in our cultures, particularly in the Western world, but I think pretty much all over the world, we have created systems that stamp on curiosity. And curiosity is what gives us ideas. If you're not curious, you're very unlikely to have uh, a, a plethora of creative ideas. Why did you decide to break apart individual creativity and corporate creativity? Individual creativity, that is, to me, that, that's looking at habit. It's all the stuff that we can do. You know, you know people who try and get me in to do these, these brainstorming techniques for their companies that I would, I would resist doing. And it, it, what they thought was that we, uh, if we learn these techniques then it means that we'll be able to go into a brainstorm and come up with better ideas just by knowing these techniques. Now, if you think about the way that computers work, um, the brain's a processor. It's not a computer, but it's a processor. Um, if, if you've got a really good data set and you put it through um, a Raspberry Pi and you put it through IBM's latest supercomputer running the same algorithm, from both of them, you will get great results. It will just take slightly longer on the Raspberry Pi. If you have got a really crappy data set and you run it through the algorithms in these, you will get crappy results, even on the supercomputer. <laughs> so it's input, process, output. And what these companies were trying to do was they were trying to address it by process. That's the equivalent of the computer and the algorithm. But it's the data set is the thing that differentiates you. So as a, as a person, if you want to be somebody who can come up with ideas that no one else can come up with, that's completely possible, totally possible. All you have to do is put things into your head that other people don't have in their heads. Because all of these things you put in your head is the fodder that you use to create ideas. So if you have, if you spot things that other people don't spot, if you have a broader and more interesting uh, load of knowledge that you're putting into your head that other people don't have, you will come up with ideas that they could not come up with. And that makes you valuable. And that's not so much to do with the processing, it's more to do with your input. So to me, about when we're looking at individual creativity, it's about these kinds of habits. 
And I explain a lot more about that in the book and how to do it. Um, but when it comes to companies, it's actually it's more to do with uh, social engineering. So when you're in an organization and um, you've got a hierarchy in an organization, each layer of hierarchy is a layer of fear. And what happens is uh, they act like lawyers and, you know, nothing against lawyers. Um, <laughs> no, 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 we can we can have things against lawyers. It's all, fine. all right. All right. So, OK, <laughs> some some things against lawyers. <laughs> um, Right. If, if you're to go, if you've got a document, you've got a contract and you take it to a lawyer and you say, could you look through this for me? If they kind of like flick through it and go, yeah, yeah, it looks good. Hands it back to you. You don't feel as if you got any value out of your lawyer. If your lawyer, however, gets out their red pen and, or, and a fluorescent marker and starts saying mm, this clause here, I think we need to reword it so that it covers you in this way. And I think that we're missing out in this protection here. And, you know, they're looking for problems. And that's what a lawyer does. A lawyer looks for problems and they try to mitigate against problems. Everything they do is trying to reduce the risk of problems. Now, that's the way that people operate in different layers of a hierarchy. So you've got, um, you know, you show something to your boss and they're thinking about their boss above them and thinking, oh, man, I need to make sure that I don't look like a fool if I take this idea to them. So they start picking away at it, spotting the problems in it and um and, and that then diminishes the idea so if, if you're to get an idea that goes through all the layers of a hierarchy it gets diminished at every stage in that hierarchy and if it makes it to the top it's a miracle and if it actually does make it to the top it's more than likely been damaged along the way and made smaller because all these people have got their own little agenda that they add to it and that doesn't work for ideas the only way for ideas to actually work in an organization is for them to bypass the hierarchy. And that's one of the things in the book, I explain multiple ways of doing that and how different organizations do it successfully. Um, and if you've not got the interest for having ideas at the very top of the company, it's not going to happen. Those ideas won't make it. Yeah, and, so, yeah, absolutely. No, go ahead. Keep going. So so that, so it's just to, to me, the, the, the whole thing about looking at it from a, a corporate point of view it's more about uh, social engineering. Um, it's to do with organizational change, all, all of the things that, that companies need to do and actually giving a crap about their employees again, mm -hmm. you know, actually sort of caring for them, um, maybe putting it into their contract that you expect them to come up with ideas. There's so many things like that that I talk about in the book. So it's, I try to be very practical about how individuals can get better ideas out of themselves, which is one thing, but a very different thing is a management thing. And it's how to get better organizations out of a massive group of people, better ideas out of a massive group of people. And I, I really enjoyed the fact that you separated those because when you talk about individual creativity, one thing that you gave me some insight on or really some hope for was the idea of individuality. And what I mean is, you know, again, I think I'm kind of, tainted being on this side of a microphone for so long, but we see so many uh, pitches or different ideas, but that are also similar that I've lost faith in the fact that individuals can be creative and add value. Because like you said, there's nothing new under the sun. But one of the things you talk about is this idea of harnessing your divergence and creating a structure that allows you to harness how you are different. What's your thinking on one person's ability to actually put useful information into the world as opposed to just more information into the world? <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. More information into the world. Oh, okay, when my, the day my book came out, I made a mistake. I knew it was in bookshops and I went to find it in the bookshops and uh, I went to the first bookshop and they said, oh, I think we had a copy commit. I think it's just been sold. We we ordered one copy. We think it's just been sold. And it's just like, all right. So I don't get to see it on the shelves, but I guess I can I can, I can, can kind of say that I, I, I'm sold out <laughs> <laughs> in a bookshop. They bought one copy and someone's bought it. Okay. Yes. So I went to another bookshop and they were like, yeah, it's in their storeroom somewhere. We've not put it on the shelves yet. You know, I'm walking around these bookshops and there's just so many books. Mm-hmm. And then I go to one of the biggest bookshops in London because um, I knew that they had ordered 
a few copies of the book and I went there and, the, and I found they'd ordered three copies of the book. It's like, whoa, three copies <laughs> of the book. Look at me. And because I knew the number, I then walked into this bookshop and I'm walking past these tables and there is stacks of books. So here's this new book that's come out by this famous person and there must be 50 copies of it just on this one table. And I, I'm, I'm walking through the bookshelves and I, I have to go up to the sixth floor of this bookshop to get to the section that I'm in. And by the time I got there, I had passed so many piles of books by the time I got there to see my three copies <laughs> on a shelf. I was demoralized. I was like, there is so much information out here and there is so much rubbish uh, that, that's on these shelves. And I'm just like, ah, it's, I believe in my book, but is my book just another load of information that's exactly. out there? And, and, you know, and, and, I think you have to have, you have to be honest enough with yourself to have these sort of ex existential moments. I mean, I, I do believe in my book. I really do. But, you know, there's, there's so many books that are out there. And, and to me, writing a book is just one platform. It's just one way of getting the information out there. I think the most important thing is to have a message that is different. And there's so many people... We, we, we get these echo chambers and these things become trendy. And, you know, as, as you're saying, culture is one of these things that a lot of people have been talking about in recent years. Um, organizational change is another thing that's been talked about a lot. Uh, productivity is another thing that's been talked about a lot. And if you're wanting to find something that's a different way of looking at things, a good thing to do is to be a contrarian and to react against what everyone else is saying. So if there is an echo chamber going on and everyone's talking about productivity and getting things done, then actually react against it. And it's part of what I've done with this book is actually saying, and, and I'm, I'm writing about this quite a bit at the moment in newspapers and magazines and things, is, is that productivity is our current poison in business. So I'm absolutely reacting to what everyone else is talking about and saying is a good thing. That productivity is focused on doing and the thing that differentiates a company is thinking. Thinking and doing are completely different actions. When you've got people who are focused on doing, you are stopping them from thinking because you're not giving them the time to think. You're not giving them the space to think. You're not giving them the ability to have interesting input to come up with interesting ideas. Because if everyone in your organization is so busy just doing stuff, then they're all thinking the same way. They've all got a minimal um, amount of input. You're not going to get ideas of any value from them. So, yes, I, I, I think it's, it's good to be contrarian. It's good to question stuff. And I would encourage people to do that um, with positive contrarianism. It's not just pointing at things and going, oh, that's crap. Right. It's actually, it's actually sort of going, I don't think that's great. Let's question it and let's find out, is there a better way? Yeah, you, and you talk about that contrarianism in the book. I want to highlight because if you're if you don't have the depth of knowledge at this point that I have after reading the book or, or you have in writing it, it can come across as, well, if I want to be heard, just say the opposite of everyone else. And that's not the point. So there's this quote in the book that I think highlights this, which is your difference is worth little if you ignore it and try to fit in with everyone else in the group. Now, again, you want to talk about obvious, non-obvious. It's not that oh my gosh, I've never thought of that, right? It's just how I, I want everyone to take real a real thought here, really dive in and think, how much of my difference do I either ignore, try to ignore, or try to hide? And then why, right? And, and I think that's when you're talking about contrarianism or divergence, it's not necessarily doing it for the sake of that, but it's doing it to see how does my different experiences or my difference allow me to think differently from this echo chamber? Yeah, it's, it's to make sure that all the things that are your different perspectives, your different knowledge, your different ways of doing things, your different assumptions that you have, embrace them because that's what makes you valuable. If you think like everyone else, you become a drone. You become of, of no value because anyone else is thinking your way. You become a replaceable work unit. And that's not what I want to become. It's not what I want any anyone that I love to become. <laughs> uh, when you get value is when you are different. And that's to embrace everything that makes you different. It, it makes me sad that there's been a drive towards diversity 
um, in, in recent years and companies are, yes, going for diversity. But if you treat everyone the same and force them to fit into a very strong culture, then what you're doing is you're eliminating their difference. You're eliminating everything that makes them valuable. Mm -hmm. And I think that's disrespectful to the human. And it is also, it, it destroys value for the organization. So, so you're losing value on every single front. And I, I, it's something I want companies to, to fight against. Well, and I completely agree. You know, Dave, the last thing I want to talk about here is in your book, when you talk about finding your creative mojo, you really give a prescriptive way of being creative. And, and so there's a couple things I want to do. First, I would like you for, for the listeners to actually tell us about your creative place, because we talked about it before hitting record, but it's, it's really interesting. And then walk us through a little bit, your advice on the, the, when, where, what, et cetera. But before we do this, so that that's your question. You can now tune out. All right. Before we do this for the listeners, here's why I want Dave to talk about this too often. I think we are told that we need to do things a certain way, or we are in jobs where we need to do things a certain way. And Look, if you don't do the hard work or you don't read it or you aren't forced to, you might think, well, I got to work from nine to five and that's just how it is. Or, well, I, I better start being in meetings this way. I better show up in this way. I better look like I'm busy. And in reality, the best work, the best anything is going to come from not Tim Ferriss telling you how to do it. OK, not Gary Vaynerchuk telling you how to do it. Not Chris Stemp or Dave Burst telling you how to do it, but you figuring out how to do it on your own. And I just think that that is what this section of your book alludes to. It's questions and then say, now you figure it out. So with that preface, Dave, tell us how, to, how you are creative and how we can be creative. I'm sorry, listener. I'm going to sound like a complete douchebag now. Um, th this, is, this is something that uh, it's a place I've been going for more than 10 years. It's a gym that used to be round the corner from a big ad, ad agency where, that I was creative director of. Now, when I needed to think, I was in this ad agency and, and as the creative director, you know, your diary gets filled up. It's hard to do the work because people are constantly wanting to talk to you. So if I had lots of work to do, my PA used to call it meeting room three. And meeting room three was the jacuzzi of my local gym. And people could never find meeting room three, which was great. So what I would do is I'd disappear out the office and I would go to the gym and I would get into uh, my swimwear and I would get into the jacuzzi with a, a notebook and a pencil. And I discovered that doing that, getting out the office, going to a place where I had no technology, I had no mobile reception, that I could get so much work to get done. I mean, unbelievably, a huge amount of work done, but not just that. I had the freedom of thought. I was thinking in a different way because I was not sitting in my office chair. And I didn't have the political pressures of the office or any of these things. I was liberated. And I discovered then that it was an amazing place for me to be able to think differently because I very much separate thinking and doing. And thinking's a place, it's a, you need time, you need space, you need an environment that's good for it. You need the, the freedom to be able to think in ways without being judged uh, and the safety to be able to, to think in these ways. So that's how I wrote this book. So I would go to, I, I wrote most of this at my local gym. Uh, I wrote most of my last book <laughs> at the local gym as well. And I would go to the jacuzzi and I would think about stuff. So I'd think, right, okay, what, what, are my, what are my beliefs in this? What are other people saying about this? And then I would draw my thoughts. So instead of writing down, I would start by putting it into diagrams because if I could put it into a diagram, even a Venn diagram or a process diagram or anything like that, that would help clarify my thinking. And that was how I crystallized my thoughts was by drawing, first of all. And then I would take these illustrations and I would write all the things that I thought were important to note coming off them. And then I would take all of that and I would um, I would go to my computer. I'd, I'd, I'd go upstairs to the coffee shop, get dressed first, of course, because that wouldn't have been pleasant for anyone. Otherwise. That, that wouldn't be creative. Uh, no, 
<laughs> it just to be embarrassing for everyone involved. Um, and I would uh, I'd go up and I would start to flesh that out more, maybe do a little bit of research um, from academic journals and all sorts of things to try and flesh that out a little bit more, uh, make sure that my thinking was robust. And then I would write that stuff. So, so to me, that there's two different parts. There was the thinking part was something that I would very much try to use pictures, uh, a pencil and a notepad in a jacuzzi. And then there was the doing part, and that was uh, at my laptop. So that that's a lot of the time how I work. Um, these days, because I do so much traveling, I, I find that airplanes are fantastic places to work. There's just this right level of isolation because you can't really get up and move around too much. Yep. So, so I'm, I'm focused. But there's also these things where I can, I can turn one side and I can, I can look out the window and, and I see the clouds and there's something just beautiful and, you know, give you, I think it almost gives you perspective just being able to look out from that kind of height on whatever you're thinking about. I think it, the, the, there's this psychological thing that I find it does to me. It gives me a perspective and a clarity in things. And then I can turn my head the other way and I can see a four-year-old picking their nose and, <laughs> and you know, that, <laughs> and, and you've got... Um, so you've got the right amount of stimulation and isolation, and and to me that that's what airplanes are fantastic for. Dave, let me and, let me let me jump in here because this is, I spend a ton of time on airplanes, and this is so funny. So I completely agree with you, right? For the first like two years, airplanes, I j I actually enjoyed them because I'm stuck. It's quiet, but it's noisy. And then I discovered instead of doing work. My actually my most favorite thing to do on airplanes is sleep. OK, so so now I can't actually work. I sleep. So I was talking to a guy who we're going to have on the podcast, this brilliant scientist. And he told me, Chris, do you know why airplanes make you tired for me? And I said, why? He said, your oxygen level drops so dramatically on an airplane that oftentimes if you had an O2 monitor on your finger, like the same way you do at a hospital, it would be blinking as if you are not getting <laughs> enough oxygen. So here's wow. the thing. Yeah, yeah. So, and when I have him on the show, we'll get clarity. But my point here is this. I completely agree with you. However, it might also be hallucination from lack of oxygen. Whatever it is, nice. you're, you're Maybe being I need creative. to use that little mask that drops down from the top. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I love it. I just, I couldn't help it because I, I, that's something that's always stuck with me. But that's really interesting. Oh, yeah. you, you've, you've given me an area to investigate there. Please, that, that's, that's very interesting. Do it. And now that I've said it, I feel like I'm going to need to back it up. So I'm going to have this guy on very soon and, uh, and <laughs> I will report back to you. <laughs> but uh, but anyways you know i i loved what you how you have found your creative space tell us how you recommend others find their creative space because as i mentioned prior to it's not about you having the answers it's about you having the questions that hopefully help others find their answers yeah i i i think people just need to be more self-aware <laughs> i think that there's so much that that we we live life on autopilot and there is that whole thing in, in uh, Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast or Slow. He talks about uh, type A, type two, type type A, type B thinking, or is it type one, type two? I can't remember. Yeah. Um, and basically, it comes to something like 80% of the decisions we make in our life, we make unconsciously. And I think just a little bit of awareness sometimes, just a little bit, bit of consciousness to go, how am I feeling right now? I'm, I'm feeling good. I'm getting lots of work done. Why? Why is this working for me? Now, when I question people about this, and I'm, I'm hopefully just about to do an academic study into this, about the places where people feel that the ideas come to them. But when I talk to people about this and from academic stuff that I've read about this, it's very often ideas come to us when we're relaxed. Uh, ideas come to us when we are doing a low level, uh, something that doesn't require much cerebral activity, but it's a low level activity like washing the dishes. And there's all of this stuff about wh when the ideas come to us, when our mind is operating at its best. With all this stuff that I've done, I'm finding that people are not saying that the ideas come to them when they're at their office desk. So in offices, we've got this curse of presenteeism where people are to sit at their desk. They're expected to sit there. And what's in front of them when they sit there? There's a keyboard and there's a monitor and there's a mouse. And what all that uh, desk furniture does is says that this is how you show you're being productive is by hitting these keys. Hit them harder, hit them faster, come on. 
Um, and that's and having your bum on that seat. That is not where the best work comes from. The best work comes in different environments. And I just want people to question, just to be a little bit more aware, to try new ways of doing it and find what works for them. Because an art gallery might work for some people, but it might not work for others. So it's find that space, find the thing that works for you and uh, and embrace it. And if you're a manager, don't force people to be sitting at their desk. Encourage them to get out and to go to places where there is an interesting level of stimulation. There is a different environment that's going to cause them to think differently, think more broadly, come up with ideas that you wouldn't normally get. And again, I just wanted to to highlight that and end on this because in the book, you've got these specific questions. But the the key here is... Instead of seeking answers, you know, seek questions. Like you said, become more self-aware. Uh, it's more fun and it's more individualized and it's more beneficial. So, Dave, as always, it's been a real honor, a pleasure to talk to you. I feel like, you know, we're just old friends at a bar, just uh, learning some <laughs> things together. So it's been great. I want to reiterate that the book, it's called How to Get to Great Ideas, A System for Smart, Extraordinary Thinking, Dave Burse. As always, it's been a pleasure. Is there anywhere else? Like, are you, you know, still writing or, or, or what's the deal? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Still always got stuff on. I'm actually, I'm just finishing off a, a documentary at the moment. So I'm also, as well as being a writer, I'm a, uh, I'm a documentary filmmaker as well. You were doing uh, so, something so, uh, with, with TV or film last time we talked, like a mini series yeah, or something. Yeah, well, I had, uh, I had a television series last time. There's a, a six-part series, half-hour episodes. Um this I'm, I'm doing a short film. It will be about 20 to 30 minutes. Um, we're, we're in the edit stage at the moment. We just had to do a little bit of filming yesterday. Um, finished most of our filming last week. And I wrote, directed, and I'm presenting this film. And it's looking at what it is that makes some businesses better at getting ideas out of their staff than others. So that's basically mm-hmm. what the corporate creativity part four of the book is about. Um, I take some of that thinking and I explain it on film. So it's actually, it's quite, as, as you'll sort of hear from, from me in this podcast, I do quite a lot of laughing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, 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 so so the, the film is quite lighthearted in places. And, you know, I, I use am, quite amusing ways, I think some places of, of trying to explain some of these theories. Um, so that's hopefully going to be coming out um, probably February, March next year. Nice. I've, I'm in talks at the moment with a, an internet um, TV station about doing a chat show as well. So I may be doing a chat show early on next year, which will be focused on ideas and creativity and, and how chatting to people who have come up with amazing ideas or have are, are, got interest in creative professions and to talk to them about how they come up with great ideas and, and using some of my thinking as the filter for some of that. Um, and then, so, so this year has been the year of the book. So I, I've, there's been seven books published this year that I've either fully written or have contributed to, and including one that I illustrated. <laughs> and um, I got a couple of books next year, early next year coming out. And, but I want next year to be the year of broadcast. So I want to be doing a lot more film. That's what my focus is for 2019. Um, and academic study as well. So I've got a study at the, I'm doing at the moment with um, a university in Ukraine. This is looking at the states of inspiration and flow in ah. business leaders. So if you are in any position of management, any if, if you manage any people in your job, I would really love it if you could contribute to this study that we're doing, which it's a bit.ly link. So if you go to bit.ly so bit.ly bit.ly slash leader flow i think it's called um I'm, I'm i'm pretty sure it's called okay um so 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 bit.ly slash leader flow um that will I'm, I'm sort of trying to find it on twitter now just to make sure but but that that's a study that i'm trying to get people to take because we're trying to understand about um the state of flow and being inspired in the workplace. And then we've got more studies we're going to be doing after that. So, so I'm involved in academic study that, as well that we're going to be bringing out next year. So I just went to it and that is the URL. So it's bit.ly slash leader flow. It's a, uh, looks like, I don't know, maybe eight question, 10 question survey, uh, looks great. And so we'll link to that as well. 
And I will say, by the way, we hadn't talked about this, but the, the idea of flow, the study of flow, the topic of flow is one of my favorite things of all time. I, I actually always include in my top three books of all time, the book flow, which yeah. I, I mean, it is, I, I will never forget. I got about a quarter of the way through the book and I had highlighted so much of the book that I stopped because I realized that, you know, it's just one of those ones where highlighting makes no sense if every sentence yeah. is yellow. You know what I mean? So <laughs> yeah. when people ask me, what are your favorite books? It, there's always ins and outs, but that one's a staple. So anyways, uh, when when that study comes to fruition, make sure you let me know what you found. We'll I have will you back too. on. And, and if, if um, can you can you pronounce the author's name? Yes. The flow? Yes. It is Mi- Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. That's right. Yeah, I I can never remember that. Me, 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 ma, or ma, ma, ma. Yeah, <laughs> chick chick. Because I I spent time. It's chick sin me high. I'm almost positive. Now I'm sure I'm getting some part wrong, but um, that's that's how I say it, and I think I'm pretty close. So. Anyway, me, me if you're listening to this, if yeah. you could just write to Chris and let him know. <laughs> yeah, please, please uh, enunciate your name for me. It's great. Man, that's good. Well, Dave, again, thanks so much time. For, uh, you know, thank you so much for your, your time spending it with us. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And thank you for listening. If you've listened this far through they, the podcast, that's very good of you. They have. <laughs> they better have. Dave Burst back again. One of my favorite guests ever. So glad to have him on the show again. Dave's book, How to Get Great Ideas, A System for Smart, Extraordinary Thinking, can be found at your local bookstore and on Amazon. And as always, if you make any purchases through Amazon, whether it's your daily shopping or books that you've heard on Smart People Podcast, please make sure to use the Smart People Podcast Amazon link located at smartpeoplepodcast.com slash Amazon. Any purchase you make through that link comes at no extra cost to you, and it greatly helps support the show. And if you're looking for other free and easy ways to support the show, head on over to iTunes and Apple Podcasts and leave a rating and review over there. I'm super excited for a lot of really cool stuff that we've got coming up. So make sure you stay tuned to all things Smart People Podcast. Head over to smartpeoplepodcast.com, sign up for the newsletter, and keep your eyes and ears open for new interviews coming out and some special announcements in the coming days. All right, that's it for us this week. So we will see you all next episode. This week's episode was brought to you by Blinkist. In today's age, it can be hard to sit down and learn more. You may think that you don't have time to read a book. Well, think again. Blinkist is the only app that condenses thousands of nonfiction books into the best key takeaways, so you can read or listen to them in just 15 minutes. Right now, for a limited time, Blinkist has a special offer just for Smart People podcast listeners. Go to Blinkist.com dot com slash smart to start your free seven day trial. That's Blinkist spelled B L I N K I S T dot com slash smart to start your free seven day trial. One more time, Blinkist dot com slash smart.